Uh, howdy y'all, I'm Joe Hughes. I'm here to lead this presentation entitled From Power CLI to API. This is all about taking your automation skills to the next level uh, legitimately for this crowd that's already into PowerShell scripting. This is more like taking your skills to the next step, but sadly that does not uh, get acceptance for a kitschy title at most conferences, so let's just play along. Uh, getting into this, who am I and why am I here? I'm a senior solutions architect at Pure Storage. Um, I'm super glad that we're sponsoring the event here. Feel free to drop by the booth, grab some stickers. I think we're out of pretty much all the other good swag and everything. That's my pitch for the company. I work really, really hard to have a clear distinction when I do community things versus when I do work stuff. Uh, please don't ask for support until the session is over, otherwise I'm gonna send you to Mike in the back. Yeah, you can, you can field all those questions, right? Uh, if it's anything troubleshooting, expect me to be legitimately clueless or point you to support or tell you it's at least gonna cost you a drink at the bar. Uh, honestly, what's more relevant to this session here. I'm a co-leader for the Denver and VMware user groups. I am a serial collector of communities um, in tons of technology and evangelist groups from VMware to, Jesus Christ, uh, Cisco to Veeam Vanguard, Tanzu Vanguard, uh, and part of the V Brown Bag crew that does uh, essentially webinars like this every Wednesday night. Uh, it's part of why I have the dub of the full stack geek. Um, you can find me easily in any crowd by the colored hat, the big grin, and the loud howdy y'all. I have very little shame and I try to share my learnings with others. Um, I ask everybody to push themselves to learn more and do not fear sharing, right? I don't want this to be your reaction when you get up here to do these presentations. Especially important about all of this stuff is sharing your experience and your knowledge, right? Perspective is important. I might say this thing a thousand times, you say it slightly different once and somebody gets it when they never understood what I said. Also, teach whatever you can. This comes out of be the master. I hate that this ended up getting rolled into, what is it, uh, soft skill? No, uh, own your tech career by Don Jones. The original four versions was be the master. This is all about bringing a uh, apprentice journeyman master methodology that exists in like trades and bringing this to IT to try and help train other people up. If you are the one person that does a thing, you will never get the opportunity to do other things inside of your environment, so train other people. Your value to the organization typically is the fact that you can make it that a thousand people can do what you do with your knowledge, your expertise, all of your guidelines put into the scripting and the automation, and then you go focus on more important things to the business. Unless you are Microsoft, there's a good chance your company doesn't actually do technology. They need technology, it's a part of the business, that's not how you make money. That's not the widgets that you make that makes the company do things. Focus on those issues. And always important, job versus career. Your job belongs to your employer, your career belongs to you. Be in the driver's seat, make effective decisions, do the stuff that you want to do. Do not be dependent on that single paycheck from that employer and expect that that is the only thing you will ever have an opportunity to do in your career. Okay, past the soft skills. Um, starting at the beginning, right? We always want to start with the plan. This is my usual opening for user groups about code and automation specifically. Start with a plan and plan for success. There's a couple of other anecdotes for this. There's the six Ps. Proper uh, preparation prevents piss poor performance. I always forget that one for some reason. The easier one to remember is fail to plan, plan to fail. Expect difficulties in what you're going to be doing, but plan for success. You wanna define a goal, this is within automation, this is for nearly anything you're doing within a project. You wanna be know where you're starting, you wanna know where you're going. I don't know why my slides are auto-advancing, this is annoying. Um, we'll just go ahead and build this one out and see if we can pause it. Um, speed and performance are great. These are not the true benefits to your organization with your automation. You want to focus instead on things like standardization, validation, and efficiencies that are gained with your efforts. This is the real power of a lot of the automation and putting your mindset to doing these things properly. You want to standardize the way that tasks are performed and you will know that they are performed the right way every time. You wanna be sure that they are done in that specific fashion that you have defined and you wanna make sure that they stay that way over time. This really gets pushing more towards item potence like Brandon uh, mentioned in his keynotes. God, that is annoying. Um, all right, we'll just keep going back, I guess. 
we want to work towards idempotence. We want to have declarative infrastructure, but that's more of an infrastructure as code conversation that we'll have later. But think about those concepts. Think about making sure that your environment is set up in a defined way every time and it stays that way over time. You know that as you change these things over time, you can update the expected results that you had in your plan from your automation efforts, right? Design these things so that you can validate all of this throughout your code lifecycle. And you're gonna know when you gain more efficiencies because you have these measurable results. You have these small tasks that you can look at over time. Maybe as you learn a better way to do things or you've just figured out a better way to structure the way that your code is working, you can get to these results quicker. You're gonna have a lot of positive results out of a lot of these things along the way that are not just speed and performance, right? Everybody focuses too much on that at the beginning, that I can do something and I can do it fast. That's not the real benefit you're gonna get out of a lot of automation efforts. You want to also focus on MVP, right? If you wanna be a Microsoft MVP, that's great. That's not what I'm talking about here. This is minimum viable product. You wanna aim for small incremental changes that you can increase or iterate over time. You want to have these small measurable tasks so that when you make changes, you can know if you're going in the right direction or the wrong direction. Honestly, even if at the end you just get to a less complicated process without making additional changes along the way, that might end up being a better result even if it runs slightly slower for you. That's entirely up to you and your definition. Sometimes by having more structured code that runs a little bit slower, it's more understandable for other people to use your tools and consume this, and therefore you can offload those tasks to other people. That might be a win. No matter what it is that we're doing, don't forget the PowerShell basics. Git-help is your friend, right? Read the docs, read the examples. For a lot of these things, even if you don't have examples exactly in the documentation for what you're looking at, somebody else has probably figured this thing out and put up a blog post about it, right? Go read that. Searching is not necessarily learning, but it will help you out, potentially just understand from a different perspective of what it is that you're not necessarily getting at the time. PowerShell is built for pipeline. Even as we are working with an API, you can follow this same process. You're gonna get information about one thing and when you try and make another API call, typically you're going to need a unique identifier for that. You take that property that you get from a single object, you parse out exactly what it is you need and you pass it to another commandlet or another API call. It's still gonna work essentially the same way, just the code's gonna look a little bit different. Think Legos. I leave this in here for two reasons. Number one, anybody who's worked on a recent Lego set, uh, my personal favorite is actually the Voltron set, what you end up with is not only the five lines that make the awesome robot, but it's a, I don't know, like 17, 1800 piece set where the inside components, all these small pieces that go together, you would not imagine make up this entire massive thing that you have at the end of it, right? These have books of instructions that show you step by step how to put these things together. This is the way that you wanna work with all your code. You want small modular pieces that you can put together that do easily explainable, easily readable things that give you a final result. And also because the first professional presentation I gave ever, somebody gave me feedback that I put the improper plural for Legos because apparently the plural of Lego is still Lego. And since that guy trolled me, I just liked having it in here because it keeps me a little bit grounded. Forget what your teachers told you. Cheat and look up the answer whenever possible. Legitimately, your business is not gonna care if you found an answer through nine hours of you troubleshooting or like no offense, and I, I mean nothing by this, but Steve Valdinger doing 25 minutes of, of troubleshooting as we're trying to do a live advanced function for API stuff. That's cool that you have the skills to do that. If you can achieve that answer in five minutes because you found a blog post or an article from somebody else and you now know how to get to that result quicker, your business is gonna be happier with you getting there, right? Use these things that you have available to you, use the tools, use the resources, use the examples from other people to get to the end faster. Specifically for this VMware stuff, right, just to explain, we're actually gonna be working with two different APIs in a lot of these things. We have the SOAP API. As you're using all these PowerCLI commandlets, all the native PowerShell stuff, this is actually going against an older XML-based, more rigid and not quite simple object access protocol as it's defined. But there are more examples of usage, right? You can get into the language a little bit easier. You can understand what you're doing and trying to get to the end a little bit quicker by learning some of these things and, and using examples that exist for SOAP. But as we look at the REST APIs, right, it's an architecture used for any newer API, right? Most new features for a lot of products are gonna end up in REST before they end up in their PowerShell toolkits, right? So this translates to other APIs outside of the VMware environment. 
Normally I do this presentation to both VMware and PowerShell user groups, so I like it because it's pretty simple and it's easy. This is more about the process of learning and using something you know, using something you can at least grasp the concept of and learning something new from these things that you can put together. We're gonna look at two different levels of the API access here. High level is gonna be the native Power CLI commandlets, right? Getting a cluster, getting a host, getting a virtual machine object. This covers most use cases. It's pretty easy to read because it's PowerShell. It has pipeline access. Problem is it abstracts the APIs a little bit. This is going to mean overhead. Low level API is gonna be something like get view. This will give us the vSphere managed object view. Essentially, this is going to be like almost as close as we can get to the raw API through the XML interface. It has 100% API access for properties at least, not every method, not everything you can do on a virtual machine exists this way. It is not as easy to read. You need to understand the API and therefore you have to RTFM. Unfortunately, it's not get help. The point with a lot of this stuff is as you move and at least understand the process of moving away from PowerShell just a little bit to get over to the raw things from the API and then move back over to PowerShell, you get a lot more advanced in the things that are accessible to you by understanding what is supposed to be the programmatic interface for a lot of these tools that you're trying to use. In these demos, all we're doing is some PowerShell, some Power CLI. I know I buried the lead in the title. Uh, we're gonna do interactive console. It's some stupid simple scripts. Most of this is all copy paste, right? It's more about the process and understanding how we can use these tools and learn things that we don't know currently. We're gonna hit two different APIs. One is gonna be this VCSA API. Essentially, this is the management layer for our vCenter server that does all this clustering and all these magical things. This is gonna present services and configuration of that virtual appliance itself. This vCenter API is gonna be every virtual machine that we have that exists inside of our environment, right? So single object, multi-object, service-oriented versus multi-object, multi-tier, like folder structure types of things. Other components, obviously, we're using a vCenter server. We're gonna to get to this API Explorer. This is kind of a swagger open API light interface that we're gonna use, and we're gonna read some documentation. One of the reasons that I use vCenter for this stuff specifically is because even as I'm talking to PowerShell folks, number one, y'all are 10 steps ahead of normal like VMUG um, user groups that I talk to about this stuff because they typically have not done a lot of automation. But even without understanding how vCenter works, how virtual machines work, most people that do PowerShell can understand the concept of, I have a machine, it has an assigned number of CPUs, some memory, a disk, and a network card. That's it, right? That's all we need to know. We're just building objects looking at it in PowerShell instead of necessarily looking at it inside of a GUI. We're also gonna use VS Code. As you are trying to navigate a bunch of these things, whether it's traditional objects or looking into APIs, look at show-object if you've not ever used this, uh, uh, this commandlet that comes out of the PowerShell cookbook module, I wanna say from even like 2015 or something, gives you an awesome um, .NET view that's a navigable tree that you can look at different objects to get sub-properties for it. Just an awesome thing to have. With that, we will go ahead and get into the demos. Okay. Everybody still see in the back? Hopefully. All right. So all I have set up in every one of these windows is essentially just setting a credential, connecting to my vCenter server. This was just to get these things out of the way because sometimes it takes a couple seconds, right? The comparison we're doing here at this level is to show us at the most basic we're comparing something that is a PowerShell object, these .NET objects that come back from this native uh, PowerCLI commandlet git-vm versus this managed object view that we get with git-view. Again, you don't necessarily need to understand all of these things that are here and how vCenter works. This is more about understanding that if we're using PowerShell tooling sometime, there's a little bit of overhead because we get the pretty formatting, because we get the pipeline connectivity and things like this. When I look at an object that comes back from git vm versus an object that comes back from git view, one of the easiest things that you can see for the difference here, the object that gets returned from git vm runs through a PS1 XML file, right? It gets PowerShell formatting. Some developer somewhere said you need a name, you need a power state, you need a number of CPUs, and you need the amount of memory on this virtual machine. That's your default view if you don't define anything. Whereas on the right side here, when we're getting this manage object view, like I said, this is very similar to what you're gonna get back from the raw API. What you are getting is more categorical view of these uh, attachments and of these properties of the virtual machine, right? We have capabilities, we have a config, we have a layout, we have an extended layout, we have a storage category, we have the environment browser. 
One of the biggest reasons that this, I mean, legitimately, if anybody doesn't know, PowerShell was probably one of the first major uh, third-party PowerShell modules that existed. Uh, well, plug-in at the time. Um, sorry, Snap-in. Man, it's been a while. Um, so it's been around for a long time, right? Even these PowerShell commandlets that exist here within PowerCLI all came around in, I wanna say, like starting in the 2008, 2009 timeframe. So they've been around for a long time. They've made lots of improvements with this stuff. But because of the fact that this has the overhead, that this has the shim layer that's there to give it back to you as a PowerShell object rather than the raw API view, there is this overhead. To show you part of why this happens or what is underlying with some of these things here, we can look that the same exact information that we want to get from this API view exists here on this .NET object under an extension data property. So what it does is goes and gets all this information first and then it basically builds a bunch of script and note properties on top of it to give you the formatting to return this thing. For an example of what these differences are for some of this stuff, right? You can just see where I'm having to go access different properties to get similar information from these, right? So in here, I have to go multiple layers deep against my .NET object to get the same information that I can get faster from pulling things essentially out of the API itself. Again, not digging super far into the details for this stuff, but also with this git view, because again, I'm accessing essentially a raw API layer, there's more things that I can get with this. Specific to VMware stuff, you get these things like view types, where the API will give you API level views of lots of different types of objects, right? If I wanna get a view that's relevant to a cluster or a compute resource or a data center or a data store or an actual host or resource pools or storage, Again, I get everybody may not understand all these different constructs, but these APIs have views that are specific to different types and different categories of objects that it will give you back, right? Where you get a raw view that has all the properties that exist rather than a limited view for some of these things. Another important thing about this is to take and look at the properties that exist on these things. And again, this is going to be pretty similar for any place that you have a PowerShell uh, commandlet set that sits in front of an API. Uh, yeah, let's do methods, let's do this. From this API view, when I look at what exists for methods rather than versus the, the .NET method, right? For a virtual machine object, there's not a whole lot of stuff that I can do here. I can put it to string, I can get the type, I can get the hash code, right? Because again, I'm talking to a PowerShell shim layer that's above this thing. On this side, on the .NET view, what I get is all of the methods that exist from the API for every object that is a virtual machine type, because I'm talking to the raw object, not a formatted object, right? Similar to when you guys are running commandlets or you're running your own reporting, if you ever, you know, pipe out to select object or to format object, you have changed the original object and you're working with something different, right? Similar concept here. Think about this as you go to start working with APIs just for the fact that when you get closer to the thing rather than the abstraction layer, you're gonna get a little bit better performance. To go through some examples of this, I'm gonna show you what the overhead looks like on this thing going to basically adding the PowerShell wrapper on top of this versus what happens when you get the raw object. This is a small example, this is a small lab environment, but this was 1.89 seconds to run the PowerShell commandlet versus eh, 1.25. Typically, in environments that I've worked in the past where we were working with 4,000 plus host objects and then upwards of tens of thousands of virtual machines, we could see anywhere from 30 to 80% overhead by talking to the PowerShell commandlets versus talking to the API. When you're doing things at scale, and especially when you're having to report or do things quickly, that is a massive speed improvement if you know how to get to the information that you need and to get to it quicker. For another example of this, um, these .NET objects and pulling this out of the interface. In this, I'm gonna get a virtual machine and then I'm gonna pipe it to get snapshot and get hard disk. And I get, this is a faux pas, right? I'm putting everything on the same 
pipeline, so I'm getting two different types of objects that return with this, but I'm getting 2.35 seconds to get back from every one of these things, just a snapshot that exists of these, and then the virtual disk that is underlying all these virtual machines. Whereas instead, if I switch over and do a thing where I'm gonna run this, and then we will look at the code, where I talk to the API layer itself, we're gonna get a little bit better results out of this thing, right? Less than a second to get this back versus 2.35 seconds. In this layer though, what I'm doing is I'm doing one get against every virtual machine and I'm pulling out all of these properties from different layers of this API. Things about the guest operating system, the config of the virtual machine shell object itself, different summaries which are calculated properties that exist downstream if anybody has ever used RV tools, essentially this gives you 99% of the data that comes out of the VM tab for all of your virtual machines. And then it adds in all the information about the disks. And I'm doing some formatting for the snapshot objects that exist with this stuff. The nice thing about working with the APIs as well, instead of just using the PowerShell commandlets, again, you get pipeline, you get all sorts of awesome things that you can do with it with formatting. You can do these things on your own and define a little bit easier what it is that you're trying to get out of these things. Um, we'll go ahead and skip. You know, if anybody hasn't seen show object again, it's worth, it's worth looking at. But um, to get a bit better view of what it is that we have with these things, the results of this virtual machine object that I get back from this, here, let's, let's make it a little bit easier to see in VS Code, these are all the properties I'm getting back from every one of these virtual machines that I have predefined and formatted how I want it to come out structured, right? Dumping this stuff out to a CSV file, um, talking to APIs to get configurations or to get running states and understanding where and how things are configured inside of your environment to save these things on a daily basis, because you never know when you're gonna have an outage or somebody will accidentally delete things is a very powerful concept, and if you understand how to talk to APIs and you understand how to do a lot of these things properly in minor steps, it's not that hard to put together, and it will save you a lot of time and a lot of headache, especially in instances where you don't have PowerShell tooling, right? This is the type of stuff that makes every other system that doesn't have PowerShell commandlets wrapped around it accessible to you. This one I leave in here because this was honestly a stupid waste of time exercise that I had where I had a friend who reached out to me and said, hey, I need to switch the shell to be enabled on all of these hosts and all I have is PowerShell. And I was like, cool, let's go hit the API. He was like, no, I wanna do it in raw PowerShell. Fine, okay. So I told him like, this is what you need to run. And essentially what it is is you're SSHing into a server and to set it to bash, you run these three lines. To set it to the appliance shell, you run these two lines and then like you log out on each side. Instead of running a command to basically send one little two line blob of JSON to an API for this thing, he wrote 50 lines of code to be a wrapper for SSH session and send a stream and read stuff back and then close it. And I was like, wow, really? Was it worth this much rather than just like poking around and looking at the docs and figuring out that like writing that other bit of script from the docs took me like four minutes. This took him like two hours because he was having problems with wrapping SSH sessions. This is not the type of thing that you will have that you can easily translate to other stuff unless you're still working on a bunch of networking and have to do wrappers on SSH sessions. We shouldn't be doing these types of things anymore, right? That's my point with this. Don't keep investing a bunch of time when there are better ways to do it that are more applicable that you can use in other situations. Similar to what I do with using this same slide deck to present to VMware people and to PowerShell people, think about how you take all of this stuff, right, your small modular code that you've written, even in demo scripts, and make it more applicable to more people across the board. <sighs> VMware has a cool instance where you can actually talk to all of these APIs and all these services that exist inside of this environment because they put even these services behind PowerShell commandlets. This is a rare thing, but the thing that I like about this is this makes it way more accessible to get people to understand the basics of connecting to an API and how it's structured. When I connect to this shell service here, the name of the service is com.vmware.appliance.access.shell to change this method, right? 
What I'm trying to do is set up this configuration to change the shell, and it requires two pieces of input for this. So we'll actually walk through it and see it. But has anybody in here come out of like the original VB days? Anybody actually dealt with com objects in the past? Right? Nobody? Anybody? It's okay if you don't want to admit it. Yeah, it does, I know. It makes me feel old too. Um, Part of the reason that I show this type of stuff and we will even SSH into a server is just for you guys to understand that an API is not entirely dissimilar from a file system or looking at output from like get child object. You're gonna have parent objects, you're gonna have child objects, right? Everything that, that exists under this appliance is going to be dot and another property that lives underneath there, right? Access has multiple properties, right? The shell has a couple of pieces for a get and a set. We'll run through this to see it, but if you can figure out how to essentially look at properties on an object, then it's not that hard to figure out how to work with an API either. I'm gonna connect to this server, and what I want to do is get this service and then just run a git member to see what properties exist for this. Again, even if everybody doesn't work with vCenter and understand the concept, this is not entirely dissimilar than us working with a Windows service, right, and sending a couple of properties down the pipeline. As we look at this member type, we have a code method that is git and one that is set. The nice thing about the way that VMware put a lot of this stuff together, because they realized that a lot of vSphere admins got dragged in kicking and screaming into the virtualization environments, and now they're getting dragged in kicking and screaming to automation, right? Y'all already bought into it at least, so this is just understanding more of like the process of how to work with these things. This even has a script property for help, which is pretty cool. So let's do dot help. This comes back and gives us actual documentation and shows us the two operations that we have. Again, if people haven't been at the shell for this long and haven't dealt with like com objects and things, maybe you haven't dealt with understanding a whole lot of overloads and stuff like this, but we have a set method and we have a get method. This even tells us exactly what it gives us back from this rather than just saying it's get, right? So pretty nice that they, again, knowing people were going into this kicking and screaming, gave you some documentation around how this thing actually works and how to run it. So we want to do this get method and we want to just run this to a format list. When I'm getting the state of this service, it tells me whether or not it's enabled and what the timeout is, right? Pretty simple to understand, it's all an object. So when I run this help and set, I can see that it actually gives me an option for a config. This is essentially a blank object, right? This is a shell that gives me my keys with zero values. But I can use this help set to understand what I need to use to do the config. When I run git member on this for this configuration, it tells me here's some code methods, including the create, right, which gives me the empty shell, or create an example, which gives you some dummy data that it randomly generates, or it gives you the documentation, or if you know what you're doing, you can just get down to the note property of enabled and timeout. Right? Again, similar to working with a Windows service. Oops, wrong window. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna run this create. So when I now look at the shell config object, what I have is an object that has an enabled and a timeout value. Shows me that it's unset, it's required, and it's Boolean, right? Timeout, unset, required, and it's a long. This is not entirely dissimilar from what you're going to see when you're dealing with an API. What I'm going to do now is set it to enabled and set the timeout to 10 minutes. There we go. Damn it. Something else is going to wonky. In this instance, I'm going to get another version of the service just so we can actually go look and see what it's doing at the time that we're doing this, right? I'm gonna go set it with my shell config object, right? Just running dot set and feeding it my object that has my configuration of enabled is true and timeout is 10 minutes. And then we will just go ahead and get what is the current state of this service. Now we can see it's enabled and I've got a countdown timer showing that it's 595 seconds. Even figuring this out on the command line is not terribly difficult. Number one, if you have a good tool that has good documentation, which is part of why I use things like this to try and help people get started. But if you also just try it and realize sometimes that the old way you've been doing it forever is probably not the best way to do it anymore, right? Sometimes you gotta just give up and, and try new things. 
The nice thing about this as well, too, is if I go look at this shell config object here, pipe it to git member, right? What I have is a PS custom object. When you start working with REST APIs, when you start working with invoke REST method, it will translate all the JSON that you are using to send and receive from a server and give you back a PS custom object. I get the same exact results from taking this object and doing a convert to JSON, which gives me this blob. I can paste this as plain text or I could send this in invoke REST method to an API server and it knows what to do with this, okay? Before the next demo, we are going to flip back to the slides. If I can get this thing to minimize so I can flip my view. All right, now we talk REST a little bit. REST is client server architecture, right? Doesn't matter if you're using a web client, doesn't matter if you're doing stuff inside a PowerShell. We are sending JSON back and forth to a server. Okay, fine, my second plug for the company, by Flashdack, right? No. Um, <laughs> We have git, we have post, we have patch, and we have delete methods, right? In order of operation of which are the safest and the most dangerous to do, right? Git will get information, just like your git commandlets inside of PowerShell, these are fine, do them all day long. Post will create a new object. Typically there's put in between. I don't like presenting that one to people a lot because put will create an object if it doesn't exist, right? The better option to use is patch. That will update an existing object. Again, you need to understand the unique identifier of the object you're going to work with to send that back in to tell it to go update this thing rather than create a new one. And then delete makes things go away. I mean, these are all HTTP methods. This is not entirely different from what you're doing when you're using a web browser. These are going to be the same return codes that you get from using a web browser, right? Different distinctions, different increasing numbers for how they code errors that you have once you get into the higher numbers for things that you do that don't quite work right on a REST API, but essentially 200, good. 400, not so bad. 500, you really broke something, right? <sighs> to make this like, I don't know, kind of as stupid simple as I can for the alignment for some people that just still don't really understand like what it is we're trying to do. Oh, whoops. Okay, apparently my slides are wrong. <laughs> This is supposed to be read, then create, then update, then delete. Right? I should have flopped my get in my post, right? So we're gonna get objects first, know what it is we're working with. Inside of this tree view that we will show inside of the documentation, typically every object or every type of thing you can get back from a REST API is going to have a get that will return all of them. Then it will typically have an, a property that will let you query for a specific ID and let you return one instance of that thing. So yeah, sorry, I will fix the slides before we post them back up live. Let's go back to the demos, right? Anybody have any questions? Anybody understand mostly what the REST API stuff is? Because this is the point at which it might just completely blow up. Thought it was gonna have to disconnect AV. Okay, so we're gonna go RTFM on this thing. The developer documentation that exists here for VMware is pretty nice because it's still written from a view where they are expecting that the majority of people coming to read this are going to be infrastructure and server operators, people that do VMware operation stuff all the time that are getting into code. So as we go look at the APIs, number one here, we're gonna have two different APIs that are gonna be primarily where most people are gonna look at, right? This vSphere Web Services API, that's that older SOAP XML API that's there. This vSphere Automation API is all the new REST stuff. When we go to this reference, not only will we see that we have this appliance REST API, which is the thing we talked to earlier, that gave us information about our access, right? Where we went to access and then we went to shell. Come on. I really hate you have to click exactly where the thing is. That gave us the information about getting and setting, right? So it shows us our operations. The color coding for a lot of these things are even typically standard, right? Across all open API docs for what are safe and what are things you really should be careful when you're doing them. What we're instead going to go and look at is our REST API for vCenter. And I like showing this introduction because of the fact that, come on, where was it? Oh, here we go, sorry. The getting started with vSphere REST APIs in five minutes. 
This is not entirely dissimilar from everything you already do inside of PowerShell. Some people just forget that we do some of these steps. Number one, you authenticate to an API web uh, endpoint. And a lot of people are like, well, when I go get a service on my machine, I don't do this. Yeah, you do. You logged into your computer in the first place, right? You authenticate. You give it a known piece of information to say, give me back the privileges that I had to do these things before I go make my next call. The next thing we do is we return this session ID in subsequent calls. Again, eh, it's just pretty similar to what we're doing inside of Windows, or especially if you're talking to things across the network, it's gonna validate that the token that you already have, right, or your login to AD has not timed out and still has these permissions to do these things. In this instance, we're just putting it in an HTTP header. It's not really that different. And then we're gonna run through these examples of creating a virtual machine and getting details about the VM. We just end up doing it live a little bit more. To make sure that everybody kind of understands how we're gonna structure these things, first we're gonna go back and we're gonna go get some more service information, but we're gonna do it in a PowerShell way, right? We're gonna talk to the REST API through native PowerShell commands. The vCenter server that I have here is defined, it's just FQDN for an object that I'm connecting to. My base URI that I build everything off of is gonna be HTTPS to this server name slash REST, right? That's just the beginning endpoint for all of these things. The session URI, where I need to go create this session token and authenticate the first time to then turn this thing back into a header and set it back across, is what we're doing here. I connected this endpoint com slash VMware slash sys slash session. It's in the docs, right? You're always gonna find these things in the docs, whether you're looking at an open API doc or if somebody still has just plain text documents, you'll find what endpoints you are supposed to connect to for a REST API. In this instance, just for everybody to kind of understand how we deal with REST API, number one, this is the most basic type of authentication that you are going to have. We send it a username, we send it a password that I'm pulling out of this credential object, right? Username, colon, password. We then have to get the UTF-8 bytes, we have to wrap it and convert it to base64 string, and then what we dump back is this, right? This single header that comes back. I'll show everybody what this looks like once we actually construct this object, but this is all the information that I need just to authenticate to get my initial token before we actually try and do anything. Um, normally, you should not have this skip certificate check, but I'm in a lab, self-signed certs, so right, makes it easy. In the past, and especially doing this in, in Windows PowerShell, that was like, I don't know, 17 lines of code with calling classes and doing a bunch of weird extra stuff. Um, fortunately, we don't have to do this anymore. Let me get a clean shell. So again, I've defined my vCenter server. I'm building just some variables to pre-populate stuff that I'm gonna go through and connect to. As long as I type my password incorrectly, we should get this stuff back. Nope. Well, Unauthenticated, hold up. Joe typoed. There we go. The authentication response that I get back from this thing is coming from connecting to, here, that's probably easier on this view. Invoke rest method, my method is a post, I'm sending a thing, right, I'm telling it to go make this, I'm taking the header, which is this authentication, or sorry, auth authorization basic authent, which has this base64 string. Let's show what this actually looks like as the header. This is all I'm passing it, right? Here's my authorization. Here is my literal username password just converted to base64, right? This is just standard formatting you're gonna have. More advanced APIs, you will need to look up how to deal with doing bearer tokens. Those get fun because of the fact that they also have a timeout. So there's a method to get a token, and then there's a method to refresh a token. And it's up to you to track how long it's been since you've sent this thing, or you need to start putting in basically try catch to say if I get a bad result after I've had good authentication, then my token probably expired, so go refresh and then go do it again. It gets nice and fun. The endpoints that I'm gonna actually connect to at this point, right? I'm going to my base URI, which is just HTTP for this server name slash rest. I'm then going to connect to my appliance endpoints. For these two, I'm connecting to system because I'm getting the version and I'm getting the uptime. This third one, I'm getting an appliance management API endpoint that lives under these health checks. So it gives me this information back. Let's go construct our endpoints and then we will go grab the data, right? We're just building variables at this point. 
when I fetch this data, we are invoking rest method to each of these. We're again passing our header, right? Oh, I probably should have switched the view on this one. Passing that session header back into this, we're giving it the URI that we constructed out of the base plus these other endpoints we're connecting to, telling it don't mind my self signed certs, and just capturing these in a variable, right? Not dissimilar from everything we do day in, day out with PowerShell. For the raw view of some of the stuff we get back from this, let's do our version response. This is not pretty PowerShell because what we're dealing with is JSON, right? Every one of these responses has a value property to it to then give us all the stuff we're actually looking for. So if I'm looking for the specifics about the build or the versions on these things, then I have to drill into what these are, right? If I want to capture the version, if I want to capture the build information, this is where I'm going to get this, right? There's my specific version. Here's my build, right? Sub properties that I'm pulling out because I don't necessarily care about the summary and the title and the type of every specific text string that's in there. I just need to know the values that are important to me, right? So I can parse this out from the documentation, run it in PowerShell, and make these PS custom objects that come back to deal with all of this stuff, right? At this point, we're doing raw JSON, and it's coming back, and PowerShell is converting these to PS custom objects, so we can work with them in a fashion that we understand. This health value is nice, and I always like showing this one, because this basically makes like executive dashboards. Because what do they want to know? Is it red, is it green, is it yellow? Nobody really, come on, yeah. Um, uptime, this gives us like time in milliseconds that since this service is restarted, right? So some of this stuff, again, you have to understand the data format and the structure that comes back from it, and then you can do simple things like put it into an actual time span, right? Here's the number of days, here's the number of hours, here's the number of minutes, here's all the number of seconds, which is interesting that it's doing that modulus for it, um, to get back exactly what it is you want from these things. For the more interesting view on a lot of this stuff, one of the things that I also like doing and one of the reasons I like using this tool is the fact that we have access to, again, I will say a swagger or open API-ish interface for this, right? On this vCenter instance, we have the ability to go get VMs and create VMs. They knew that this is gonna be one of the core things that a lot of people were gonna try because this is the way they built their documentation, so they put this object at the top, right? They're trying to make it very simple for people to try and do stuff. We're gonna go actually create a virtual machine in the API. This will give you back all of the return codes for basically like, here's the one that shows you you did everything correctly, here's the ones that show you you messed up something in between. In every open API interface that you deal with, or what used to be Swagger, there's a button that says try it out. This really means I'm gonna do it live. You get a warning in this one, right? It gives you a pop-up and it asks are you sure. A lot of them don't. Just realize this is what you're actually doing with this thing. So let's go get our VMs and uh, let's see. We want to do no query on this, right? Let's just execute and get back every virtual machine we have inside of this environment. Again, pretty similar to what we were doing inside of invoke rest API. This will even give us a curl command for all these things and this will give me back a summary of all of these objects in an API view for all of this stuff, right? You can download these things. A lot of open API interfaces will give you stuff like this where you can copy to the clipboard the response that came back from the JSON so you can start formatting or parsing things out. Or you can download it as an actual file. If I actually want to know the JSON for this thing and like stash it somewhere so I can recover it or rebuild it or whatever, you can just download these things. A lot of this is really handy. I get that it's not command line, but if you're trying to learn things and you're trying to investigate stuff, use the tools that are available to you. Let's go create a stupid simple virtual machine. Okay. What we have inside of the documentation here for create VM is similar to what we have inside of this interface. And just to give everybody kind of the basic overview of how we're going to work with an API and stuff, um, this will show you this request body that we have to actually go pass parameters in and create this object type, right? Fortunately, everything in this REST API defaults to application slash JSON, so you don't have to give a content type. This is just what it defaults to. For me to create a virtual machine inside of this environment, I have to give it a definition of a guest operating system, 
placement information of a data store, essentially what underlying disk it's gonna live on, and a folder. These are not the names of these objects, these are the managed object IDs. So you need to learn how to get these things so that you can put this piece of information back in to run these API calls. Not dissimilar from getting a piece of information to pass it along the PowerShell pipeline to another commandlet. Some of the things you need to understand about working with APIs and API documentation, there will be times that you are gonna have defined enumerations of what are possible acceptable values for these pieces of information you have to pass back in. Fortunately, there is a list of guest operating systems that you can pass back in to create these virtual machines. I like using DOS because why not? So what we're going to do is we're going to actually create a dummy virtual machine from the command line. Or well, so from the, from the uh, API Explorer here. To show everybody that I'm not faking or anything, right? My API demo has zero virtual machines. It's entirely empty here. We're gonna go back and we're gonna create a VM by going into our developer center. Go back to the API, I should open another window. I'm gonna give it this post of slash API slash vCenter slash VM. The post method says I'm creating a virtual machine. I'm giving it dummy data where I'm just gonna say, sure, do it live, right? Again, this one instance, it gives you a warning and says, are you sure? Most APIs won't, it just does it. And it either works or it doesn't. The response that I get back here is the actual instance ID, managed object reference ID of this virtual machine. We use this lab a lot to deploy and destroy things, so this was VM number 803,159 that's been in, in this environment, um, so we do this a lot. For anybody that's trying to learn how to do this stuff for the first time in PowerShell, there are awesome commandlets that exist. There is an awesome module that is curl2ps Go get that because every time you look at these documented examples on API docs or within things like Postman collections, you can take this curl statement that was written for doing things at the command line at Linux or PowerShell that has the proper aliasing. You can dump this and have it convert to PowerShell. So you can read these things and understand it in a language where you're not learning the language syntax at the same time as the commands you're trying to do. But this created a VM object, so we will go back. Tell you what, let's make it quicker and easier to flick back and forth. If I go look at my inventory, I will see that I have created an object. It is a virtual machine, it has a name. This has absolutely nothing to it that will actually function, right, because all I did was give it a name, give it a definition of what guest operating system it is and tell it where to put it like on disk and in folders, right? It doesn't have a disk, it doesn't have CPU, it has no memory, it has no storage or anything. This doesn't work. But this is step one. You can copy and paste from the documentation and build from here, right? If you wanna get into all the, the nuts and bolts on this stuff, number one, you can do a lot of these things as well in Postman, right? Not an entirely different workflow from this. If nobody's ever used Postman, it's really not that bad. I'm running a post method. I've got my URI that's in here. I'm telling it I'm using basic, basic authentication with my username and password. Don't worry, it's a demo environment. Feel free to steal, steal the credentials or whatever. I send this, the information that I get back from it is the session ID. This is the information I have to put in that VMware-session-ID piece that goes into the headers for all my subsequent calls. I'm gonna copy this and I'm gonna go update my git-vm. I'm gonna tell it I'm using an API key. The key is this, the value I'm now updating to this new session that I got from this and I'm gonna run send. This will give me back that same list of all the virtual machines that I had from doing this stuff in the API Explorer. It just gives it to me in the expanded JSON view. I can dump all this, I can save it, I can parse through all these things if I want, or I can go and run the same methods. That's fine, we'll just leave it there. I'm gonna go update to this same session ID, right? New variable that I did. This time we're gonna go create an actual functional virtual machine. Let's let this run while I dump in the body. Boom. This is going to be JSON. I'm gonna send this and let it run. Okay, I get back another VM ID, right number, it's now up to 160 of 803,000 that's in this thing. But in this instance, I've defined, here's my boot configuration. This is the device, I'm gonna to boot to a CD-ROM, here's the definition of the CD-ROM, here's the file on disk that it connects to, all my SATA devices, my CPU, my disks, my memory, blah, 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 blah. 
Once this thing is now actually created and exists here inside of the inventory, I can go look and see that it is here, and I can actually go power this thing on. As long as it responds in time, I can go and I can look at the console. Come on. Hold up, let me refresh. Oh, why are you not giving me, there we go. Web console, and I can see if I can catch it. This thing is defined as a Windows VM, it's attached to a server 22 ISO, and it's now running a Windows install, right? Copy paste, nobody dies, it's not that bad, right? Go try it. <laughs> Legitimately, all right, I'm over time, I'm done. Um, Hopefully you guys got a little bit of something on, from this. You learn a little bit from the process of going and learning things. I challenge everybody, go learn some stuff, go share with other people, give back to the community. Um, we actually have uh, a link for session feedback that is freezing on me right now. Let's see if I can get this back in the slides. It is uh, powershellsummit.org slash session feedback or use the QR code that we handed out to everybody. Give feedback. As a leader of user groups who does events like this, we absolutely need the feedback of what sessions were good, what were bad, what suggestions you have, what things we can do to improve this stuff and make it better. If I did something wrong, cool, come present next year and show me what I did wrong. That's what I challenge anybody. Thanks for joining.